Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And uh, Lord, we've gathered tonight because we want to open up the Word of God and learn about it and learn about you from it. And uh, Lord, as we try to delve in now, help us to put aside all the distractions. And my goodness, there's plenty of them tonight. But Lord, still more, we want to keep our eyes on you and not on the angry waves that surge against the soul. And Father, speak to our hearts tonight. Let us walk away tonight uh, having met with you and spent time in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, you can open to uh, Luke chapter 24 and get verse number 44. Tonight we begin our study in biblical survey. And just by means of announcement, there is a reading assignment. So we do have the books here for this class. Uh, The reading assignment is to read the introduction plus all the way to page 25. The introduction is half a page, so don't don't be intimidated by that. And uh, the reading does go fairly fast because the font I use in my books is fairly large for a book. So uh, hopefully that won't be too much on your schedule. Luke chapter 24 and verse number 44. Jesus is going to give us a breakdown for the Old Testament. Now, of course, the first part of biblical survey, we are going to go book by book through the Old Testament. But I want to give you a few introductory thoughts and notes on the Old Testament as a whole and try to help you understand it, not only from the Christian slash Protestant perspective, but also from the Jewish perspective. All right, so a couple of terms uh, just to get these things out of the way. The Jew, what we call the Old Testament, right? A Jew would just call the Bible. And to be honest, I'm not so sure he would call it the Bible. If he's a really good Jew that sticks to the Hebrew, the word Bible comes from a Greek word, biblios, which means the book or book. Uh, so you guys have it in Africa, bibliotheque. It's, it's the place of books, right? That's where you get the book. So uh, <clears throat> what we have in... In Hebrew, they wouldn't say Bible, they wouldn't say Old Testament, because it's just the Testament for them. They call it the Tanakh, the Tanakh. Now, the Tanakh is a a word, it's a made-up word. They took the beginning of three other words and put them together to come up with Tanakh. Their Bible breaks into three parts. They have the Torah, which means the law. They have the Nevim, which is a Hebrew word for the prophets. And then they have Ketuvim, which is the Hebrew word for the writings. Right? So we have the law, the prophets, and the writings. So if you take the first part of Torah, you get the Ta part. Then you take the Nevim, you get the Na part. And then Ketuvim, you get the KH at the end. So that's Tanakh. So if you're talking to a Jew, you use the term Tanakh. He is probably, most likely, going to know exactly what you're talking about. All right, so let's get it in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Jesus said, and and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses. There's part one, that's the Torah. And in the prophets, there's part two, that's the Nevim. And in the Psalms, there's part three, concerning me. All right, so... The reason Jesus would say the Psalms instead of Ketuvim or the writings, Psalms was the first book in that third section. And for a Jew, remember, they didn't have books back when their portion of the Bible was being written. They would use a scroll. So when you handed a Jew this portion of Scripture, this writings or the Ketuvim, the first title on that scroll would be Psalms. And for many Jews, if you say, hand me the Psalms, you are handing him this entire portion of the Bible. All of these books of the Bible would be included on that scroll. So this is like a heading. It's like a name or a title for that section of the Bible. So you could call it the writings, sure, but also Psalms would be an acceptable title for it. And that's the the breakdown that Jesus gives us for this. Now, what is the purpose of the Old Testament? Well, again, it depends on who you ask. If you ask a Jew, the purpose of his Bible is to tell his story. It is the story of their nation. Our God is the creator God. And then that creator God eventually chose our forefathers to be blessed and and, um, to have great revelation from God. And he elevated them. And now the Jews are the specially chosen people of God. 
meant to be a light to the world. And all nations should eventually come to the Jews for their light, for their law, for their teachings, and so forth. So in the Jewish mind, the Bible is there to tell their history. And that's why the order of their books are different than the order of our books. They order their books. There's some debate as to why they do this. But some Jews even debate this. They will say that they order the books of their Bible based on the level of their inspiration. So we would consider every book of the Bible equally inspired, right? We believe the Holy Spirit superintended all of the writing, but then also breathed into those words after they were penned, thus bringing them to life. So all the words of the Bible in our estimation are inspired of God. In the Jewish mind, the Torah, that's gold medal. And then second place, you'd have the prophets. And third place, you'd have the writing. So they don't see them on equal footing. And they say, we order our books by the level of inspiration that we attribute or believe to be in each book. Now, also, a Jew would uh, look at this and say that he's ordering the books to tell a particular story. God started off, everything was perfect in creation, and then things went downhill. But then after the flood, eventually Abraham comes. God chooses Abraham. He's their, uh, the forefather for the Jews. And now God has set up a plan to bless the world. You, everybody remember this from Genesis 12? In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So now they, they see, the Jew looks at this and says, well, you see right away the Bible is focused on the Jewish people blessing the world. So then you have Israel going into captivity, but God miraculously brings them out. And on it goes. God gives them instruction, and then you have their history. You have these prophecies about them being punished. But then by the time you get to the end of their Bible, their Bible ends at Second Chronicles. I don't know if you, I hope you've read your Bible. I hope you've read 2 Chronicles. If you know how that story ends, at the end of 2 Chronicles, you read where Cyrus, king of Persia, tells the Jewish nation, go back to your land. Well, now in the Jewish mind, that's as good as it gets. That's what they want. They want to be restored back to their land and have their kingdom back. They want to have control over their own land. So this order of the books it tells the story exactly the way they want to hear it. It ends on a high note for them, with them going back to their land. Uh, take your Bible, come to Matthew chapter 23, and you'll see the Jewish order of books in the words of Jesus here again. Matthew 23. And let's get verse number 35. Matthew 23 and verse 35. Jesus says that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel. All right, where do we read the story of Abel? Genesis. Genesis. Unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Anybody know where the story of Zacharias is told? That's Chronicles. That's over there in 2 Chronicles. So Jesus says all the righteous blood... And then he gives us two bookends, from Abel to Zechariah that was slew by the temple, there by the altar. So he gives us Genesis to Chronicles, thus outlining, if you will, a start and a stopping point for the Jewish Old Testament. Now, their order of books is the same information that we have in, in our Old Testament, but they order them differently. So just to walk you through it, the Torah is the same as it would be in, in our Bible tonight. And then Joshua judges that would be the same, but then things begin to change. The book of Ruth, as you can see, is over here on this side. Can everybody see that? Okay. Everybody back there, can you see this a little bit? A little, not so much. Okay. So Ruth is over here. So you get Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and then in their Bible, it goes to Samuel and Kings. Now, I, and I've written it, it, it is like that in their Bible. It's not First and Second Samuel. In their Bible, it's just Samuel and kings. Now, even in other uh, um, Christian editions of the Bible, these names have changed. It used to be called 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 3 Kings, 4 Kings. So what we know as 1 Samuel used to be called 1 Kings because that is where the line of the Israelite kings started was in 1 Samuel. So that, that, those names have changed a little bit. 
All right, so for the Jew, he goes Samuel Kings, and then a big difference skips in. It goes right to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then after Ezekiel, you don't get Daniel like we would expect. You get the 12. All right, to, the fuller name is the Book of the Twelve. And what they do is they take all of what we would call the minor prophets. We break the, pro the prophetical section of our Old Testament. We divide it into two. We say the major and the minor. The major prophets are these guys, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. I would include da uh, Daniel as part of, a, part of the major prophets, but there is some debate about him. But then the book of the 12, for us, that's um, Hosea all the way to Malachi. Right? There's 12 of those prophets. In the Jewish Bible, that's one book. That is the book of the 12. All right? After that, then you would find the Psalms, Proverbs, Job, then Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther. And you see, in our minds, this is bouncing around quite a bit. And even for their history, it bounces around. That's not a straight line through their history. But again, remember, they're, they're ordering this according to what they view as uh, incredibly inspired, right? So that's, that's why there's a big difference. And then towards the end, they have Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah is one book in their Bible, and then Chronicles. Now, just like we saw with Samuel and Kings, they do not make First and Second Chronicles. It is just Chronicles. So it ends on, in their mind, a high note. Go back to your land. Now, just an interesting little note on the book of Daniel. The Jews do not count him as a prophet. I don't know if you noticed this, on the list, he's included in the writings. So this is more what we would think of as the historical section, right? When they say writings, they're just talking about um, spiritual poetry and spiritual history, you know, the history of our nation from a spiritual point of view. So they see Daniel, they see him not as a prophet, but more as a visionary. Now, I don't want to get into all the nuts and bolts as to how the Jews decipher between the two. But they don't think that Daniel prophesied the same way Isaiah and Jeremiah did. They view those two, two uh, scenarios as being different. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc. These men, their, their spirit, if you will, intertwined with the Holy One, and thus they knew what to say. Whereas Daniel had a dream, and then he just talked about the visions that he saw in the night. So they see it as a, as a bit of a difference. Daniel, they don't see as inspired as the other guys. Now, I am very happy to rather consider him a prophet. I would definitely put him into this section. I would put him into the major prophets. Right? The reason some call him a minor prophet is because he only has 12 chapters. Right? Hosea has 12. Zechariah has 14. So they say, you know, he's minor because he didn't write a lot. And even half of that even though, you know, it's prophetic, there's, there's a lot of narrative, Daniel being thrown into the den of lions and so forth. That's a story and not so much a prophecy, right? So they consider him minor because of the size. But when you consider the content, man, that is action-packed. There's a lot of stuff in the book of Daniel. So I would consider him major. Now, the reason I'm going to definitively say he's a prophet and not just a historian is because Jesus said, Daniel the prophet. Right, you guys remember that in Matthew 24, verse 15? He said, you can go and read in Daniel the prophet. So Jesus considered him a prophet. I'm very happy to have him as a prophet as well. So the Jewish books, if you count them up, there are 24 altogether. Some Jewish uh, rabbis and scribes and so forth, they will try to condense this just a little bit. Sometimes they push Samuel and Kings together. Sometimes they'll put Ezra and Nehemiah together with a Chronicles, something like that, because there are 22 letters in the Jewish alphabet. And they think it would be a very nice irony or, or coincidence, if you will, a tufalach, if you can have 22 books to go with the 22 letters of the alphabet. But nevertheless, I'll let them argue about that. As far as I can tell, there are 24 standalone books. Now, the purpose for the Old Testament, according to the Jew, for their Bible, tell the story of their people. Now, what, well, how do we view it? What, what, as far as a Christian reading the Old Testament, what is the purpose of it? I, I would say this. This is a story of how God made the world and then saved the world. I, and that's as simply as I can put it. This is how God made the world and how He saved the world. Does it tell the story of Jewish history. Absolutely. Nobody can deny that. But if you notice in the Christian Bible, in the order of the books, 
everything has one theme and it's not Israel. They play a major part in it, but the, the theme is the Messiah. The focus is on how are we going to get out of this mess? So when we read about Abraham, where it says, through you, all families of the earth shall be blessed. We do not read that and go, well, the, the nation of Israel will bring about this blessing. We read that and say, through Abraham, we get the Messiah. Jesus Christ comes into the world. And through the Jewish nation, the Bible comes into the world. And thus the whole world gets access to God through God's Son and God's words. So we see the, the Jews simply as a channel or a conduit for God to reach and save and bless the world. So for us, the Old Testament has that overarching purpose to build up to the Messiah. Now, take your Bible, look at Malachi chapter 4. Just at the end of what we have as the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4. And verse number, let's get verse number 4. Malachi 4 and 4. <clears throat> the Bible says here, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So as we finish the Old Testament, we are looking forward to, we're told to think about Moses and look out for Elijah. Now, you know what happened when Jesus is standing on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. And that is why Peter right, says, let's build tabernacles. <laughs> because if you read the Old Testament, you know that the Messiah is scheduled to come right about the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Let's build tabernacles. Surely this whole thing's wrapping up now. Verse 6, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Where's the next time you read that in the Bible about somebody turning the hearts of the fathers and the children back and forth? Where do you read that? Isaiah. Now, we do have something like this in Isaiah. It's linked to that. Do you know? It's Revelation. Nope. John the Baptist. That's it. Luke chapter 1, when the angel Gabriel shows up to Zacharias, father of John the Baptist, he quotes this to Zacharias and says, your son is going to fulfill this. So at the, now remember Malachi, this is, you know, about 400 BC. This is the last thing chronologically that God has said to the nation of Israel. After this point, he falls silent. So you can see in the Christian Bible, the focus is on getting the world ready, preparing a way for the Lord, right? And that's where we link to Isaiah. It, it, you're preparing the way for the Lord to come. And then it obviously ushers into what we have as the New Testament. All right, so just to tie up a couple of loose ends here. The Torah, sometimes you might hear this called the Pentateuch. All right, the Pentateuch is a fine name. This is the Greek name, right? And, and it means technically, let's say it's referring to the same thing. The word Torah is a Hebrew word that means law or instruction. The word Pentateuch is two Greek words put together. Penta is five, right? So if you have a pentagon, it's a five-sided shape. And Tuk is a scroll. So it's the five scrolls or the five books. So that's why these five books of the Torah can be referred to as Pentateuch. All right. I think that's all we're going to give you as far as overview. Now what we're going to do is start to, or introduction, let's say, for the, for the Old Testament as a whole. We're going to begin to slowly march through now the uh, books of the Bible. And when it comes to the book of Genesis, guys, I'm going to limit my comments because we teach this book verse by verse. If you were with us last year, we covered all 50 chapters by God's grace in one year. And there's so much we can say and need to say about the book of Genesis, but I'm going to try to be very uh, particular about my comments now. Uh, you, we are going to look at Genesis chapter 1 in just a moment, but I'm actually going to take you to the New Testament just for a second. Come to Mark chapter 10. And uh, who better to give comment on the book of Genesis than Jesus himself? Yes. So let's, let's see what Jesus said about it. Now, the modern thought, of course, is that Genesis, the book of Genesis, is a, an allegory. 
your liberal theologian, your skeptic. Um, I was raised as a Roman Catholic. I still have my Catholic Bible on my shelf at home. And in there, the archbishop says, the book of Genesis chapters 1 through 11 did not happen. It is all created. It's folklore. It's just mythology, if you will. All of those stories are there to simply teach us a lesson. There was no person named Adam. There was no woman named Eve. They didn't eat anything. There was no worldwide flood. All of that is a myth. Now that's coming down. I mean, that's under the authority of the Pope, but these archbishops are teaching that. And they're not the only... Uh, let's, if I can use the term loosely, Christian, they're not the only Christian denomination that views the, the book of Genesis in that light. Many people think because of modern day science, you know, the, the heavy emphasis on evolution, the emphasis on uh, the age of the earth being millions, if not billions, you know, billions is for the universe, but the age of the earth would be millions of years. They say that does not fit with the story of Genesis. And if Genesis is real history, then the age of the earth has to be anywhere from six to maybe 10,000 years old. Maybe. But a, a safer year would be about 6,000 years old if you just use the Bible. Now, if you go with that, you're going to butt heads with science. And a lot of Christians are they're fearful of all the things that scientists have to say. And scientists do have a very loud voice and a long reach. You know, if you don't, if you don't go with that flow, then you stand to lose your job or look like an idiot in the eyes of academia. So people say, ah, let's just, instead of saying the Bible actually happened the way it says, let's just call it an allegory. Let's just say it was a made up story. So I'm going to walk you through some of that. But Jesus in Mark chapter 10, he says here, but from the beginning, verse six, Mark 10, verse six, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Right now, now this is Jesus referring back to the stories of Genesis to teach on marriage. Now, as far as it applies to our current, you know, hot topic of the day, God made them male and female. Right? That was all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. I'm happy to just stick with the opinion of Jesus. You can stack all the scientists of the entire world up on one side and give them, you know, give them their, their chance to explain things. I'll take the explanation of Jesus every time. Um, so you have the creation. Jesus acknowledges that it happened. Verses 6 down to 9, you have the order for marriage, that God said the two shall become one and that they're not supposed to be uh, torn apart. So there's the ordained structure for marriage. And then if you get Luke chapter 17, let's flip over to that, Luke 17. Now, I'm going to talk more about the scientific aspect of this in just a moment, but I want you to see from the mouth of Jesus, creation, according to Jesus, creation happened. And it happened the way you read it in Genesis. The ordained structure for marriage, a man and a woman, married and supposed to stick together. Divorce should, should not be an option, right? That's not the way God set it up. Jesus is acknowledging Genesis. And then Luke chapter 17, verse 26. Luke 17 and 26, if I can not find it, but see it. Whew. There it is. It says, and as it was in the days of Noe, that's the New Testament spelling for Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. And then in verse 27, it just explains it. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Jesus acknowledges these things. Not, he's not tipping the hat to them as good stories. He is acknowledging them as a real part of history. So when we read the book of Genesis, the right way to read all of its information is that it is genuine history. That's from the mouth of Christ. So I'm going to stick with that. Now, in, the, in our Genesis class, we give you various outlines and breakdowns. So I'm going to skip doing all of that now. Um, when you have the book handy and you read through it, you're going to have all of these outlines. So I don't see the need to uh, say it out loud with you in class tonight. But take your Bible to Genesis chapter 1. I do want to say one thing about the scientific aspect of the book. You'll hear people say things like this, that the Bible is a religious book and it's not a science book. So we should not learn science from the Bible. The Bible is only there to teach us religion. It's there to teach us how to be good people, how to love one another. Well, amen, I, I agree with that, 
But I also think the Bible is, when it speaks on historical things, it's right. When it tells us things about archaeology, it's right. And when it makes claims that, can we say, uh, crosses the line into a scientific field, I find it to be accurate. Now, now let me explain what I mean. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning. Right away, the Bible is way out ahead of science. Because the prevailing thought of scientific minds for, I don't know, thousands of years. It was only recently, as far as world history is concerned, that science admitted there must have been a beginning. Right? The whole Big Bang theory, that is not an old, old theory. That's something that's come about relatively recently in the history of the world. The Bible had it there for thousands of years. In the beginning, there was a start to everything. Right? So according to the second law of thermodynamics, there's entropy in a closed system. Things run down. So if you know much about the cosmic radiation and the background waves, and I don't, I'm not any kind of expert on that. But when they finally reached out there and, and found this cosmic wave moving through the universe, they said, well, we can see it moving at a certain rate. We can measure it. it it's slowing down. It's, there's entropy. So obviously we can go back and back and back and pinpoint there had to have been a beginning when everything blew out because there had to have been this one point where everything went out from there. So they have now acknowledged a beginning. Well, then that's consistent with the Bible, is it not? Modern day science is consistent with the Bible on that point. In the beginning, there it is. There's a beginning. Now, they have assumed there is no God. That's a presumption. They started with that idea. They, they, they haven't tested that theory. What they've said is we have created a story that doesn't necessitate God. Well, just because you create a story that doesn't have him in it doesn't mean he's not there. So in the beginning, that's, cre that's consistent. And then you have... Verse 2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Verse two, uh, 3, rather, and 4, God brings forth light. There's light and darkness, and, the, and there's a separation between the two. Now, I must admit, it's difficult to uh, really say much about this scientifically, because after God brought everything into existence, then He begins to shape everything. He begins to move things into their place. He brings light into the universe and so forth. But... I've read a few science books. You know what they admit? That there's a darkness out there. They call it dark matter and dark energy. And they say there's at least 96% of the known universe, they say we have no idea what it is or how it works. So that's why they call it dark energy, dark matter. There was darkness upon the face of the deep. So th there it stood in the Bible that there is some dark stuff out there and that not all of it has been lit up yet. So I, I don't think there's any contradiction. Science would not be able to say that verses 2, 3, 4, and 5 are wrong. Science would say there is a difference between light and darkness. There's a difference between day and night. Is that not consistent? Okay. All right. How about this? Verses 6 down to 8. God makes a firmament. All right. Look outside. Just look outside. Is there sky or is it all water? Are we under the water? Is there sky? Now we're almost under the water with all the rain, right? <laughs> but that's, that's firmament. That's open space. That's what God ended up calling the heaven, that we refer to it as the first heaven. That's, that's Genesis. What is science? Science, they say, is the rational conclusions of observable facts that you can test, retest, and retest. Okay, I can look outside Every day, you know what I'm going to find? The same conclusion. There's a firmament. <laughs> so that's consistent. There's, there's nothing, the Bible's spot on there. The next day, what did God do? There's a dry land, right? He brings back the water. The, the earth was covered in water. Then God recedes. He causes the water to recede. And now there's dry land. And then there are what I would call oceans. You guys would call seas. The Bible has you on this one. You're right. It's seas. <laughs> yeah? So, so go to the Chan uh, Ladistrantu. And what will you see? Dry land and water. Well, there it is. Genesis is consistent with that. So I don't see where they say, well, the, you know, the Bible is just religious and science tells... Everything the Bible's telling me, I can go out and observe as a fact. The next day, what happens? Oh, forgive me. One other thing. God brings forth trees and they're yielding fruit. You know what God said about the fruit? It will bring forth fruit after its kind. So an apple tree makes what? You see how easy this is. 
You don't go to an apple tree expecting lemons. You don't go to a mango tree expecting coconuts. Why? Right here in the Bible, it tells us what to expect from, from nature, from trees. I find that to be consistent, and science would not be able to tell me otherwise. The next day, God brings forth the sun, the moon, and the stars. And then if you look in verse number 14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. You know, ever since mankind has been writing things down, he has been notating time according to the sun, moon, and stars. They've been navigating and, and measuring the seasons by the sun, moon, and stars. There it stands. Science would not argue that. All right, the next day, we read about fish and fowl coming forth, and they brought forth after their kind. There's whales. Well, go down to the water. You know what you find? Fish and fowl. You got birds flying over, and you got fish moving in the sea. That, that's consistent, right? There's nothing different there. And then verse 24 on down, you have day six, the dry land animals, the, the, what we call mammals generally, right? The beast of the earth, and then us. We, we humans, we come out of the dirt, right? And then the Bible says we bring forth after our kind. Is that true? Is that what we observe? Is that what we see on an ongoing basis? Yes. So ev when I look around at life happening, and then I look at Genesis and I say, this is exactly what I would expect to see happening. So my scientific mind and my religious mind go perfectly together. I see no contradiction. The problem is, the reason the scientist doesn't like that story, even though it's obviously observably true, is in this version of it, there's a God making all of that happen. There's a God who set it up. There's a God who is fine-tuning fine the universe. And if there's a God who's doing it and who's intimately involved in what's working and watching over it, then maybe he's recording what you're doing, right? And, and, and if he's recording it, perhaps you're going to be judged. And if you're going to be judged, then you might be guilty. And if you're guilty, you're going to be punished. So in order to erase the guilt and the fear of punishment, take him out of the story. It really doesn't have much to do with science. And, and I'll tell you, if you want to just argue this from a scientific point of view, not all scientists agree on how things came to be and how they operate now. Right? So please don't, when you talk to somebody that maybe believes in evolution and those kind of things, and they say, well, I believe in evolution. You can ask them, which version? <laughs> there are many different uh, theories about evolution itself. They're not consistent in their belief on that. So from what I can see in the universe, Genesis has it spot on. When you look around at the world, I can see the after effects of a cataclysmic worldwide flood. You can see in different places of the world where the story of a worldwide flood makes perfect sense, right? And, and even in 1986, Mount St. Helens erupted in Washington state. What scientists believed would take millions of years after one volcanic eruption, they went and did the measurements and they said, if we had not been here for the eruption, we would have thought this took over a million years or a thousand years, whatever. They said, but now we know it took all of one day. It took three hours and it formed what we would normally say took thousands or millions of years. So when you actually observe and look, okay, that if you assume that there's never been a worldwide flood, then you can say the tree rings and the ice rings and all of these things took a long time. But when you believe what the Bible says, that there was a worldwide flood, all of a sudden you look around and go, yep, these, like a Grand Canyon, can be formed in just a matter of days or weeks. Right? So the, new, the, the, the biblical story seems to work perfectly, in my opinion, with science. All right, take your Bible, come to 1 Kings chapter 6. We'll talk for a moment about the book of Exodus. First Kings chapter six, and uh, give you a little bit of history on the book. First, the word Exodus is a Greek word from it. Pretty much sounds the same, Exodus, and uh, it means departure. It means to exit something. I think you can see that in the word itself. There are various ideas as to when it was written. Um, a lot of argument actually goes into that because when you try to read the Egyptian records, you it is difficult. The Egyptians were not great at, at recording everything, so it's a bit tough to nail down the date of it. But the Bible, I think, helps us with this. First Kings 6, verse 1. 
It says it came to pass in the 400th or 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Ziph, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. There's a timing mentioned, right? 480 years after, after uh, Israel left Egypt, then Solomon began to build. So you guys help me do a little math here. Solomon, his reign started approximately 990 BC. Right, he says 480 years right, after Israel came out, that's when Solomon is doing this. All right? So you have to add it because we're going backwards. That's why I'm not subtracting. We're in the BC, so we're going backwards. So if you add this together, you come to this date, 1470, thereabouts. Now, there is discussion. Now, there's always a, have you seen it in books? You'll, if you haven't, you'll see it in mine, where people do this. They put a C in the front of it. Have you guys seen that in books? All right, that C, I believe, is a Latin term. It means circa, C-I-R-C-A. It just means approximately. So there's a plus minus of maybe 15, 20 years, something like that in that date. Uh, that, I think, is the most biblical date to put on it. So without going through all the archaeologists and what they have to say, I'm going to stick again with what the, the, the Bible gives us, the biblical record here. I think that right about 1450, maybe 1470, that's when the book of Exodus is taking place. Now, the history of it, well, you can just read the book of Exodus and find out what happened. So I don't need to walk you through chapter by chapter there. I'm going to give you a few different, maybe deeper ideas. Dig below the surface a little bit. The book of Exodus, I believe, offers a wonderful prophetical picture. How many of you tonight are covered by the blood of the Lamb? Your sins covered in the blood? Yeah, a few of you. All right, good. If you're not saved, you can get saved tonight. Amen. You don't have to stay in the darkness. We can turn the lights on. <laughs> All right, if you're covered in the blood, one day, one day you're going to get out of this world via a miracle, Amen. right? Now, you said, but I'm going to die and they're going to bury me. Yep, but God's not going to leave you here in this world. So if you have been saved, your sins are covered in the blood, one day you're going to have an exodus and, and the, the sea is going to part. Now, again, you got to go a little deep with this, so stay with me. I've told you to look outside earlier. You see the clouds, right? If you were to keep going, keep going, keep going, all the way past the stars, you know what you find? A massive body of water. So there is water under the heaven. That's what we call the oceans, the seas. And there's water above the heavens. So one day when the rapture happens, you know what's, what God's going to do? <laughs> He's going to hold that staff up and that, that, that sea is going to part. <laughs> And there we come straight through that water. What you have in the book of Exodus is a prophetical picture that if you are trusting the blood of the Passover lamb, you are safely going to make it out of Egypt. Egypt in the Bible is a picture of the world. And even if the devil is chasing you, which Pharaoh chased the Israelites as they went out, he cannot get you. So I, just my imagination running with me here, but it could be that I'm, when the rapture happens, I, I, I don't want to be the last guy in the line. Because if you turn around, you might have a great red dragon chasing you up through the water. But don't worry, the sea is going to close in on him and it'll be just fine. And, he, and you'll make it safely to the promised land. Amen. Now, now, that's the prophetic picture. It runs a bit deep, but it all hinges on the blood of a lamb. Uh, if you've ever read Exodus chapter 12 about the Passover lamb, oh, it's fascinating how God did this. Listen to what he, what he said. In Exodus 12, he said, go get a lamb. And in the next verse, he says, now prepare the lamb in this and this way. And the next verse, you know what it says? Your lamb will be this and this. The world needs a lamb. The world needs a savior. But not just any old savior. It needs the savior. There's only one man that can be the savior. You can't just pick your own. There's one the savior. Only one man qualifies, and he's a sinless lamb without blemish because that was the qualification to be a Passover lamb without blemish. Every man that's ever been has blemishes, not Jesus. The lamb without blemish. And, and then it's not enough to simply have Jesus as the Savior. He is the Savior of the world. But that means nothing until you accept Him. He becomes your Savior. Amen. A lamb, the lamb, your lamb. When you're reading Exodus, you're reading a story. It's a gospel track. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
This is how you get saved. So there's some very deep and practical things, not just prophetical. Um, when you get to Exodus, right, you have, you, you're freed from the bondage of sin and of the world because of the blood of the lamb. You get out of Egypt based on the blood, All right? Now, after you get out, you got to go through a Red Sea. That's baptism. That, that's 1 Corinthians 10, by the way. Paul told us that. And then you take this water from a rock. That's spiritual drink. And you eat manna. That's spiritual meat. That's the Lord's Supper. Paul taught us this in 1 Corinthians 10. He told us to take it like that. You know what you have for the rest of Exodus? He starts giving you instructions. The Ten Commandments come out. Here's how you live. This is what I expect you to do. After you get saved, you know what you should do? Get baptized, join a church, partake of the ordinances, get discipled. And then he says, build a tabernacle. Now, I know for most people, you get to this part of the Bible and man, it just, that's time to take a nap, <laughs> right? Because, oh, my soul, it's just, just measurements after measurements after measurements. How can it be more boring? Guys, take your Bible, look at Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 5. Hebrews 8 and 5. The Bible says here, "...who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God." When he was about to make the tabernacle, for, now he's going to quote from Exodus chapter 25, verse 40. For, see, uh, see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. When Moses made that tabernacle, you know what he was doing? Guys, listen, he was drawing a picture of heaven. What you read at the last half of Exodus, the first half is Israel's in bondage. God brings them out of Egypt through all these plagues. You know, eventually Pharaoh lets them go and then chases them and drowns. And now Israel begins their marching through the wilderness. You know what happens after you get saved? You start marching through the wilderness of this world, trying to find your way to the promised land. And yet there's challenge and challenge and challenge and there's temptations, right? Amen. And then God says, build a tabernacle. Amen. And, and you know what we do? We look at it and go, oh man, this is so boring. That's, that's how a lot, that's where the devil gets a lot of Christians. Listen, you younger guys in here, you younger ladies, listen to this. Because you're all fired up. Ooh, I'm in Bible school. Give it a month. Give it a couple months. And the excitement kind of dies down. The dust begins to settle. And oh man, it's just a tabernacle. I got to read, you know, five cubits by five cubits by... <laughs> and as soon as it becomes boring, a lot of people quit. Because you've been raised on amusement. You've been raised on entertainment. That's what we shove in front of our kids to get them to shut up and be quiet. Here, just watch SpongeBob. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And as soon as something boring happens, that's, that's as if the Antichrist just showed up. What's oh, boring? <laughs> mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is not boredom. <laughs> You get to that tabernacle and God says, now, if you really want to know, I'm going to show you something that you'll never see anywhere else on this earth. I'm going to show you a picture of heaven. You're reading about home. That's your home. You need a taste. <laughs> this is home that you're reading about. Look at what you got here. Ark of the Covenant. What's that? That's the throne of God. You know, you know God dwells between the cherubims. That's, that's the throne of God. You know, have you read Revelation? Yes. Everybody loves the book of Revelation. The precursor for Revelation is the back half of Exodus. <laughs> Can you believe it? So in Revelation, you read how God is on His throne and there are cherubims. There are the four living beasts around Him. And they look just like that. Now that's the throne of God. And then this would be the courtroom of heaven. You know what you read in Revelation 4, Revelation chapter 1? The seven spirits of God which are the seven, it's lamps of fire. You know what you have here? They call it a menorah, the candlestick, seven flames of fire. That's a picture of the Spirit of God. You get that in Zechariah chapter 4, Isaiah chapter 11. And then here you have an altar of incense. The high priest goes in, puts that incense on. You know what this is? You can read this in Revelation chapter 8. There is an altar up in heaven. 
and, and the prayers of the saints are constantly going up with, the, with incense. Right there, the smoke of your prayers just going up before the Lord continually. There it is. You know what you got over here? The table of showbread. You say, what's that? Thy word, O Lord, forever is settled in heaven. You know what you got here? You got six, a row of six pieces of bread and a row of six pieces of bread. And it's always fresh. I love that. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And there's six and six. Because in your Bible, you got 66 books. Don't think that's an accident. Sure. Don't think that. Listen, God does those things on purpose. Amen. He does that on purpose. When we get to the book of Isaiah, you'll see it there because this is just a, like the trailer for that class. There's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. You'll see it line up. It's, it's an awesome lineup. Now, this is the courtroom. You got the throne of God, the seven spirits of God. You got the prayers of the saints going up on that altar of incense. And then you got the scripture, the Bible sitting up there. Now, right outside of heaven, you know what you got? In the tabernacle, you have a laver. They call it a laver. And they put the water in it. This is where the priest would wash up. So there's a, a big basin of water out there, massive. Y you know what you have right outside of the third heaven? You know what separates the second from the third heaven? A big body of water. God's given you a picture not only of heaven, the third heaven, but the universe. He's drawing a picture of it. And then if you go down, all the way down on the map, you know what you have out here? You have the brazen altar. And the Bible says the fire of this altar should never go out. You know what that makes it? Un quenchable fire. I, I know where that's at. I, I know what that's at. I, I know what that is. That's the lake of fire. So you know, if you go down, 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 if you get cast out, you, you get dumped out of, out of heaven. You're not up there. You get cast out of the judgment. You go down to this place that never stops burning right down there at the bottom of the map. God drew a picture of the universe. Now, if that's not enough, if, if that doesn't tickle your fancy, you can look at it a different way, much more practical, right? That's the doctrinal, right? That's the picture of heaven. But this is also a picture of the Christian life. Look at it. Here's what you're getting. This is what you're aiming for. You want to get into the presence of God, yes? Amen. Right? You want to walk with Him. You want to be close to Him. Draw nigh unto God, yes? Draw nigh unto God. That's the command. All right? So what do you need? It's going to, it's going to be a sacrifice. Every day, you're going to have to deny yourself daily, yes? And, and offer yourself as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. There's the entire book of Leviticus. We'll get to that next week. It starts right there. Guys, you do not get, I'm preaching now, but it, you do not get to the presence of God if you don't start down here as a living sacrifice. It won't happen. So where do you get this? The book of Exodus. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's going to be a sacrifice. It starts here, and then you better get cleaned up. You need some holiness. Draw nigh unto God. He will draw nigh unto you. What's the next part of the verse? Cleanse, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You better get cleaned up. There, there's some stuff you, you, need to, you need to wash your hands of and say, God, I'm sorry, and get cleaned up. You know what it says in Ephesians chapter 5? You, that, that Christ sanctifies the church through the washing of the water of the Word. So you get in your Bible and you say, God, please clean, clean me. John 15, verse 3, now you're clean through the Word I've spoken unto you. That's how you get clean. All right, so we clean up. Now, we, we're getting a little closer to God. You get into this courtroom, this inner portion of the temple or tabernacle. You better be filled with the Spirit. How are you going to get that? The Spirit shines light on the Word. Yes. And, and if, you're, if you, you're in here, you need the light, so you can eat the bread, but you need the bread to have the energy to go keep that candlestick lit. These two things work together. They stand over against each other, not, uh, not versus one another, but supporting one another. You need the Holy Spirit walking with Him, filled with, fill, filled with the Spirit. You need the Bible, and you better have some prayer. That incense is a picture of prayer. You get all of this together and you'll find yourself ushered into the presence of God. It's a perfect picture of the Christian life, what it's meant to be.
So the book of Exodus has a lot to offer beyond just mm, five cubits by five. <laughs> You might be interested to know all those numbers mean something also, but we just don't have time to get into that. So we'll stop right there. Okay, guys, I didn't get as far as I'd hoped, but we started a little bit later than I thought we would as well. So it's as far as we'll get. Any questions about any of this? If you're raising your hand, you might want to say something because I can't see any hands. Yes, sir? It's, it's more of a comment than, than uh, um, a question. Uh, it, it goes back to the creation story in the beginning of Genesis. I don't know if, uh, if anybody heard about the scientist Herbert Spencer. He got, um, I think it's a Nobel Prize. He found out that with in any creation, when anything is created, there's five things got to be present and it's, it's time, force, action, space and matter. Mm-hmm. And he received the Nobel Prize. And, but if you read his Bible, you would have seen that Moses actually had to get the because it's in the beginning, science, mm-hmm. God, force, created actions, heaven and the earth. So That's it. It's all there. Everything you need in verse 1. You're absolutely right. Uh, Did, was there another hand? Yes, sir. So you, you mentioned that the Jews um, ordered their books according to, their, according to their inspiration. Or, yeah, the uh, level of level inspiration. Of inspiration. Yeah. That, that's a great question. It's, it's what they consider to be the most important. Or uh, let's say like in the case of Moses, you must, and I think we'd all admit this, the interaction that Moses had with God was much more intense than what Isaiah or Jeremiah had. Right? Moses spent 80 days face to face with God on Mount Sinai. No other man on the board or in the history of the world outside of Jesus can say that. So I think that's why they would say his books are going to be more authoritative than maybe some of these other guys. I I would assume that, but that is not something I've really, I've never talked with a a rabbi about that. I've I've read just briefly on it. So that's about as good as I can answer that. All right, anything else? Okay, let's take a break. You guys get some fresh air. We'll start again in about five minutes.